everybody welcome to this video today we are talking about economics part of sst for class 7 production sst class 7 production economics so what is economics economy means the production the consumption the excess money earned by the people how it is invested all these things are part of economy the exchange of goods and services economy economics is study of such things so the study of what is produced study of what is consumed study of how it is produced and consumed the why the who and what is left over is the study of economics or study of economy now there are consumers consumers means what today the early morning you woke up you brushed your teeth so you got some paste you got some water, it came to the tap. You are living in a house which may be your own built by somebody or maybe you are tenant in a rented house. Then you wore some uniform. So you got from clothes. You don't have a cotton plant or you don't have a sheep from where you get the wool. So somebody brought it for you, made it into clothes for you. You came to school by way of a bus. You don't own the bus. The bus would have brought it for you. The school building was built by somebody. The school is giving you a service of tuition, tutoring for this particular class. All this happened. So you consumed so many goods and so many services by reaching to this class. Now there are some consumers who are also producers. For example, the hotel in which you are having your food is also a producer, also a consumer. They are buying rice from somebody, converting it into a meal and selling to you. So they are a producer as well as a consumer. What is the intention of all these people in doing something? The customer's well-being comes from the commodity that they are buying. You are happy when the bus safely transports you to the school. You are happy when the school gives you good education. You are happy when your meal is giving you comfort and no trouble to your stomach. You are happy when the soap you use is giving you a good fragrance. You are happy when the paste you use is giving you a fresh uh, feeling in your mouth. So your, your happiness comes from whatever you are consuming. Customer's happiness comes from whatever you are consuming. What is the happiness for the supplier? What is the well-being for the supplier? The supplier will be happy. The well-being of the supplier will be established when they receive an income for what they have supplied. When the supplier receives a compensation for their service. When the supplier receives something in value for whatever goods they have handed over to the end user or the producer. So, supplier's well-being is depending on the compensation that they receive for the inputs that they deliver. The customer's well-being depends upon how satisfying the commodity that you are buying, the goods that you are buying, the services that you are availing. That is what gives the customer's well-being. So what is production? We know that supplier's well-being is based on inputs he gives for production. Customer's well-being is you by you availing whatever has been produced. So what is production? Production is a process of combining, combining what? Various inputs, whatever comes in is called inputs, various material inputs and then immaterial inputs. What is material and immaterial? What you can feel, see, touch is material. What you cannot see, feel, feel or touch, cannot see, feel or touch is immaterial. So immaterial inputs, all this is combined by somebody in a process called production for what? In order to make something, make what a thing? A thing that is fit for consumption. If somebody creates a plastic goat, it doesn't help you. But if a shepherd rears a goat, it helps you because you may be interested in either the wool of that lamb or the meat of that goat or the milk of that goat. So there is something of value for consumption. There should be a customer who is willing to feel happy, whose well-being will be enhanced by consuming. Only such things when you produce, it will be called production. So, it can be goods, it can be services. That has value. Value means what? It contributes to utility. That means what? The consumer or the user feels, I got some benefit out of it. Now, there are certain things which you buy which doesn't have utility but has aesthetic value. What is that? You will buy a beautiful painting and put it in your hall. It will be very costly, hundreds of millions of dollars maybe. But it does not add really any value to you. But it gives you happiness when you look at it. That is aesthetic value. You can only feel. You cannot convert that value. 
but when you buy milk when you buy rice when you buy bread when you buy fruits it gives value to you because your hunger your thirst is taken care of when you buy clothes it helps you to wear and feel happy and show to your friends but when you have a painting at home it may not really appear like having a value because that value is called aesthetic value so that is a different utility so what exactly is utility there are so many things that you want there are so many things that you need there are so many things that you desire you desire to go on a top class car on your own to school but is it possible as a student you may not get a license you may not be able to buy such a big car maybe such big cars are not sold in your country so all those things are you desire but you don't get what are the things you that you need you need a food that is good on your stomach you need a food that gives a balance of all the nutrients required for a healthy growth for your age that is your need you need clothes you need a admission in a decent school you need enough money to buy books or textbooks or uniforms or whatever those are the needs what is a want want is something that you want to have you may feel i want to have an ice cream now it may or may not be right it depends on so many things suppose you are sick suppose you are sitting in a ice cold room having an ice cream at that point in time may not be the best thing suppose you are having a walk on the beach on a sunny day then having an ice cream could be a good one so if you have a want and if there is a product or a service that can satisfy that want it is called it having utility if you have a want if there is a product or service that can satisfy the want it is said to have utility so from cotton the utility increases when it is converted into clothes so this is called the form utility what is form utility cotton in the form of fiber and cotton in the form of clothes have different utilities likewise utility of place rice from the village if it is dehusked and packed and transported to the shop to be sold in cities as rice fit for cooking it has higher utility the paddy on the crop standing on a field in a village has lower utility both end of the day it is the same thing it is the rice that you eat on your plate is coming from the same paddy on the village on the field but the utility is different depending upon in which place that particular product is likewise there is a time utility something that can be stored something that cannot be stored normally fresh milk you can keep it for 2 3 hours you cannot keep it for 24 46 hours so what happens okay today you have a refrigerator but sometimes you cannot keep certain things in refrigerator so that is what what can be stored for future usage what can be stored for use at a right time that is something that gives you time utility if you do not study before the exam then whatever you study after the exam has no utility because the time utility of your education is before the exams if you don't have a good pen that writes and if you have 100 pens after you finish your exam what is the point those pens have no utility so utility is power to satisfy a want but it depends on in what form it is in what place it is and at what time you are having that product or a service now comes types of production how is something produced production is combining various inputs into a output that can satisfy a want that has utility that has value that has a customer whose well being will be enhanced what is primary production harvesting the gifts of nature that means what cultivation on land for crops the crops can be rice or wheat or paddy it can be rubber it can be coffee it can be flowers it can be anything horticulture everything it is also fishing and other forms of getting things from nature it is extracting or exploiting the gifts of nature mining mining gold or mining uranium or mining coal or um, uh, taking out a crude oil from the uh, deep ocean well or all part of primary production what is secondary production it is manufacturing industry what is manufacturing converting whatever we get from the primary production into something that is useful for example if you have hundreds of mango trees or coconut trees that is primary production you are producing only coconut but when the coconut um, fiber is converted into coir into a mattress into a doormat or when the coconut milk is converted into coconut powder then it is a manufacturing industry that is converting something the mango becomes mango pulp in a secondary production the mango becomes a mango juice in a secondary production so turning out the semi finished and finished good from the raw material obtained from primary production or intermediary goods obtained from the secondary production and converting it into usable things is secondary production 
So conversion of a flour into bread or iron ore into finish is all primary production. Conversion of wheat into flour is also secondary production. But when wheat becomes flour, it is intermediary good. When flour becomes bread, it is final finished good. That is how the secondary production happens. What is tertiary? Tertiary is services. Services is what? Services is adding value to a good to make it consumable. At the same time, it is not converting or changing the finished good into something else. It means what? It is adding services. It may be packing, it may be marketing, it may be transporting. All these are services. Without marketing, you will not know existence of a product. Without packing, the product will not come to you in the right shape and size. Without transport, the product will not reach where you are. The time value or the place value will not come to it. So for all these, you need services. But they are not changing the product per se. The bread remains the bread. So these are service or tertiary. Those services which enable the finished product to be put in the hands of a consumer in a form which is useful. So these services are supplied by this section to all other means. The primary producer and the secondary producer need the help of the tertiary producer. Why? The rice or wheat has to be first transported from the village field to the mill where it is converted into flour. From there it has to be transported to another factory where it is converted into bread. And then it has to be packed and transported to be put in the stores so that people in the cities and towns can buy. So the service, tertiary service is supplied to all the firms in all the industries and also to all the consumers. Why to consumers? To you also the service comes because there is a retail shop that is selling the goods to you. Before that retail shop, there is a wholesaler who acquires all the bread and gives to various shops. So all this wholesaler, retailer and all are part of the tertiary production sector. So marketing, banking, insurance, transport, communication, even education, healthcare, defense, everything is part of tertiary sector. Why? Without education, you will not know how to harvest. Without healthcare, you will not be able to work or run a manufacturing industry. So all these are services supplied by this team to the other two sectors or types of production. What are factors to production? Factors means the things that go in. When there is a production, a process of transformation takes place. The wheat becomes flour, flour becomes bread. Transformation takes place. Inputs are converted into output. So what are the inputs? For example, there are two types of inputs, primary factor and derived factor. What is primary factor? What exists on its own? For example, land. You don't create a land. Land is there. At best, you convert the land into cultivatable land by adding fertilizer. In the, for terrace farming, you make it flat. You bring the irrigation and water canals. So these are the things that you do. But land remains land. So this is a natural resource or a gift of nature. For taking out the oil, you dig a well, but you don't do anything extra. Oil remains there at the bottom of the earth. Likewise, you primary factor is labor, that is manpower. Man is there. Maybe you will add skill to a man or train a man by giving him education, but then man is already there, manpower. It is naturally given. Land is naturally given. Without these land and labor, no goods can be produced, no production happens. If man does not try, a paddy or wheat cannot be grown on an agricultural field. Man has to try. So man has to be there, land has to be there. This is already there. These are primary factors. Without this, no production can happen. What are derived factors? Capital. That is money or resources or um, for example, plough is called a capital. The ox is called a capital because these are brought in. Though they are naturally available ox like man, you have to bring an ox trained and use it here. You need money to buy a plow. You need money to create a tools by the blacksmith and the carpenter to create a plow. So all these are derived factors. Capital is a derived factor in different forms. And then there is an organization. Organization is entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship means what? Somebody has to take the risk of bringing all these factors of production together to add value to convert it into something that has utility to the end user. So this is entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is, we will study more about who an entrepreneur is, but entrepreneurship is a derived factor. A man using his capital, exploiting the benefits of land to bring out something that is of use to somebody and taking the risk of something going wrong is the entrepreneurship factor. Right? Now let us look at characteristics of land. We saw land is a primary factor. Land is a free gift of nature and because it is a free gift of nature, there are certain limitations and there are certain duties and responsibilities on us. 
man has to make efforts in order to acquire other factors of production for example capital or entrepreneurship will not come like that not everybody can become an entrepreneur but land is available to everybody it's a free gift of nature it is not the outcome of human labor man is not creating it is not an outcome of human labor and it existed before human evolution land has been there even before mankind was on earth now land is fixed in supply the amount of land we know 71% of the earth surface is water means the rest is land and only this much land you have you cannot expand the land right land is in fixed supply what happens is in certain places you dredge the sea and increase the size of the coast that is at limited extent you cannot increase it by 1% 2% you increase it in a very small minuscule percentage the quantity of the land does not undergo any change the quantity of the land does not undergo any change the quality undergoes change sometimes the extent of usable land might change that is the quality might change because of human activity or disasters when earthquake happens some land goes lost or when a um, volcano happens some land is lost when tsunami happens some portion of the coast was washed into the sea like that small changes will happen but overall the f- extent of land is fixed in supply and it cannot be largely increased or decreased by human activity some 1.000001% it's not 1% or 2% you can increase it is 0001% is maximum you can increase or decrease because human efforts are limited in their scope and not much can be made in the surface area of the land surface area of the land also you cannot do too much of it you cannot convert a mountain into a plain very difficult for human to do that like land is imperishable it is not like human being after a few days the human being will not be there now if you are 20 30 years are old you may be having certain capabilities to do certain work at 80 90 years of old you will not have those capabilities to do that work but skill will be in you whatever you studied will be in you if you are trained to be a jockey to ride a horse on a race you cannot remain a jockey at your 101 age you can remain a jockey when you are 20 30 40 years old so that is why human capability is perishable it cannot last for long but land is imperishable land your great great grandfather saw the land your father saw it you saw it and your children will also see it unless by of exploitation by of pollution you spoil and ensure it is not sustainable unless you do that land is imperishable there is no obsolescence and it will remain there as an indestructible factor indestructible means cannot be destroyed land is a primary factor of production in industries it helps to provide raw materials it gives you maybe iron ore maybe gold ore maybe uranium ore it gives all that it also gives you the seeds the plants the leaf everything that you need from the agricultural perspective land is a primary factor right land is immovable you cannot take the land here which is fertile on the indo gangetic plain and put it somewhere on the um, kanyakumari corner you take cannot take the land from china and put it in america and say okay these crops are coming well in china let this land go there and create those crops in america it cannot happen it is not movable and there are certain original indestructible powers of the land its fertility may be varied but cannot be destroyed the land's fertility will be varied. different types of land in different places have different fertility you cannot grow apple in every climate or rice will not be having same yield in all soil its fertility will be different but it cannot be destroyed completely why land is made up of silica and other minerals and materials and these minerals and materials end of the day are nothing but part of nature which are required by the plants to grow and sustain over a period of time land will regain some of its characteristic does it means what suppose you used a lot of fertilizer suppose you grew only rice on a particular land for 10 years then the land there will get depleted of its various nutrients its structure will change its composition will change its characteristic will change but suppose you leave that land empty for another 5 years it will slowly regain its characteristic loamy soil will become loamy soil fertile soil will become fertile soil alkalic soil will become alkali acidity will go all those things will naturally happen if you leave it on its own without disturbing at the same time it is not of same quality everywhere you cannot grow cotton everywhere you cannot grow rice everywhere you cannot dig everywhere and say i need petrol from here or i need um, gold from here the it cannot we cannot change its characteristics its powers are indestructible you cannot change it and make it into something else and the initial price of land is zero initial price of land is zero because land is not used by anybody and if there is a land its price is zero but then 
when people start using a particular space of land for a particular purpose then depending on its suitability what it is used for availability how much more is available and how much you need the demand and supply it becomes a scarce the availability of land becomes a scarce and then its price goes up or the rent goes up so what happens is if everybody is doing rice cultivation in a village the demand for land for cultivating sugar cane will be too much why because there is no more land left everybody is cultivating rice so the land available for cultivating sugar cane becomes a scarce and then as long as the land is suitable for cultivating uh, sugar cane and as long as there is demand or willingness on the part of a farmer the supply price of land will go up if the land is not suitable for sugar cane or if the land is available more or if no farmer is interested then the supply price of land will not go up even if everybody is cultivating rice now labor what is labor labor is efforts put in by man so there was a famous economist called alfred marshall he said the use of body or mind labor means not necessarily going and working in a farm or going and working in a factory labor means any use of body or mind partly or wholly even if you use only one finger of your hand to click on the mouse partly or wholly or you use a whole of your brain to think and create new ideas partly or wholly for what with a view to secure an income apart from pleasure derived from work you may feel happy in thinking about so many things dreaming about fantasizing you are using a whole brain but that is not labor unless you convert that into a story and sell it and make money that means what to secure an income you should be using your body or mind partly or wholly if you are very good interested in sports and if you are running from this end of the country to the that end of the country it is not earning income to you then it is not work but if your activity physical or mental body or mind partly or wholly is with an intention to earn income in addition to getting some happiness by doing that thing then it becomes a work so adam smith is called the father of economics adam smith wrote two books the theory of moral sentiment and inquiry into the nature of the causes of the wealth of nations it is simply called wealth of nations these are very famous books even today people who study economics go and read this wealth of nations once because that is such a master work now in that he talks about division of labor that is a very important concept which is uh, found to be in use in all the factories and all the offices today earlier what was happening when man started doing agriculture for example he went in to the market in search of a ox in those days markets were also not there so he went and asked so many people do you have an ox and somebody had an extra ox they gave to him he may or may not have given money in return he would have given something else in return then he brought the ox and he trained how to plow and then he plowed the land and then he himself sowed he himself did the pesticide weed aside and other fertilizer he himself har- harvested cut the rice thrashed it converted into um grains of paddy he himself uh, did a manual um, crushing of the uh, what you call the um, skin of the paddy and remove the dehusking dehusking and then he converted it into rice he himself took it to somebody else for selling then it was finally sold and in barter in exchange they gave some piece of cloth which he brought and gave to his family so this is how a person did everything on himself but now labor is perishable when he is plowing his capabilities cannot be used at home to cook food his capabilities cannot be used to go and do the thrashing of the paddy husk or whatever the labor cannot be stored it can neither be postponed nor accumulated he cannot say now i will not sow next week or one week month down the line i will sow he has to sow when the rain is right when the season is right when the sunshine is right labor cannot be accumulated he will not say i will sit quiet for one week and after that one day i will do seven day work seven day work you cannot do in one way labor cannot be accumulated labor perishes and is lost forever if it is unused if you don't do today's work today's capability to do work is lost once and for ever tomorrow whatever you are doing is tomorrow's capability to do work so labor perishes and it is lost forever this is the problem with the labor and this is the also importance of labor labor of an unemployed worker is lost forever if a person did not work if a person doesn't have a job his capability or his labor or his utility his capacity is lost once and for all when it does not work labor is an active factor of production it does not sit there quietly like a land labor is an active factor of production that means what neither land nor capital will do anything unless 
you do anything that means what even if you have a land even if you have a plow a man has to go and put the plow on the land so that it can be sowed and harvest can be done later so it is an active factor of production labor is not homogeneous every human is not the same skill and dexterity are different among people the skill and dexterity are different among people different people have different skills different people have different talents labor is not homogeneous labor cannot be separated from laborer laborer cannot be separated from laborer you cannot say okay dear laborer you are sick you sit at home let the laborer at the um, farm do the work no if the farm labor has to happen the laborer he has to come to the field to the farm to do the work labor cannot be separated from laborer man can move from one place to another in search of satisfying work in search of better pay in search of comfort that means what man will move that means what labor is mobile labor is not fixed labor is mobile land does not go saying i want to find a good farmer land does not go but man can move from one place to another individual labor has limited bargaining power one labor cannot go and tell his owner saying i need more salary i need more comfort but collective bargaining as a union you can fight for the benefit of all the members of the union together saying all of us need uniform all of us need shoes all of us need helmet to protect ourselves to do the work so trade unions can fight and have a bargaining power but individual labor has almost no bargaining power this is about the labor so what is the division of labor division of labor means dividing the process of production into distinct small components small processes small pieces small phases and assigning each component in the hands of a labor who are specialist in that process that means what somebody will do only sowing somebody will do only weeding somebody will do only harvesting somebody will do only thrashing somebody will do only packing somebody will, will do only selling of ox somebody will do only making of the plow this is division of labor a person will not do everything but different pieces of work unique distinct pieces components are identified in a particular work and then they are assigned to a set of people who are experts in doing that now what's the benefits of division of labor it improves efficiency it improves efficiency somebody who can make a ppt will do only making ppt somebody who knows typing will be doing only typing so that is efficiency specialization the labor repeats during the same task labor does the same task he is doing repetitively he will become a specialist now he facilitates the use of machinery he can use a specialized machinery if specialized machinery is not to be used or cannot be used if the labor is not specialized if everybody is doing everybody you cannot have a tractor if you want a tractor then you need somebody who is specialized in using tractor in the farm today you have medical specialization in good old days 50 years ago it was not like that one mbbs doctor will be taking care of all types of patients today you have a heart specialist you have a kidney specialist you have a lung specialist you have different specialists like that in this is the field of medicine like in teaching also you have a physics teacher you have a chemistry teacher you have a botany teacher you have a zoology teacher earlier there was one science teacher so specialization is doing the same thing again and again you become specialist and so there will be more efficiency because you will have a better knowledge a higher capability a deeper understanding of what is to be done for example invention of morse code happened because there was a specialist of sending telegraphic messages time and material are put to best use if you are not a specialist you will take 2 hours to do a job if you are a specialist you will use only 1 hour If you are not a specialist in sewing paddy you will use 100 kilo in one field if you are a specialist in sewing in 50 kilos you will sew in one uh, field like that you will have time saving or material saving when you have specialization now there are minus points also one of them is repetition doing in a small piece of thing again and again it will be monotonous what is the example for preparation of a shirt one person will stitch the button one person will stitch the collar one person will be doing the cutting one person will be doing the ironing but in your local tailor shop the tailor is doing everything now if you are doing only stitching of the button morning to evening 7 days a week 360 days a year then it will kill human ingenuity you will lose the satisfaction of doing something you will not find the happiness of doing anything complete because you know that you are stitching a button but you, you have never made one shirt unless you make one shirt you will not feel okay i provided clothing for somebody so that happiness that feeling of completeness that feeling of satisfaction the human ingenuity will be lost 
if you do only repetitive monotonous task you will feel stale also there is a scope for increased unemployment why unless there is a vacancy for an another button stitcher in another place this person who is expert in stitching buttons cannot find another job but if you are a tailor who is able to cut to stitch to iron to button then he can go and work as a tailor in either else so scope for unemployment is also high at the same time scope for higher salary is also good if you are on best button stitcher in the world then for stitching buttons you will get the highest pay ever possible so that is plus point of the specialization and division of labor cost reduction reduction in the growth of handicraft no handicrafts were there no artisans were there because now a potter will bring the mud he will mix the mud he will make a vase he will paint he will color it he will sell it now those handicrafts will not happen when division of labor because somebody will make a pot somebody will do a painting somebody will do a drawing somebody will do a glazing so the division of labor caused loss of handicrafts now we saw land and labor as two capital two types of inputs the next type of input is a capital which is a derived input capital is man made it is a physical good used to produce other good that means what it is a machinery it is a equipment it is a plant in a big scale in a small scale it can be the cooker in which you cook the rice it can be the sewing machine in which you sew it can be the cycle in which you go to school so capital is the man made physical good used to produce other goods and services this capital is also made by using the natural goods for example you cannot make a cycle or a plant or a machinery or a equipment without using the sand or the cement or the water or the air or the minerals or the metals that you get from the soil right or the wood or something so there is something called physical capital what is it it's a material resource for example machinery tools buildings plants equipments these are physical capital that you can see next is money capital or monetary resource monetary resource means what the physical cash the coin the currency the gold and then the non physical cash equivalent that means what equity that you invest to start an enterprise or the loan that you avail to start an enterprise equity and debt equity belongs to the person who is an entrepreneur who took take the risk debt is the money given by the person in return for a guaranteed regular repayment of interest that is debt in equity there is no interest there may be profit there may be loss but there is no guaranteed income in return for equity in return for debt you get a interest or a debenture payments so money capital is of two forms either the physical cash or the cash equivalent like gold and things like that or the equity and debt that comes two types of capitals now you have a human capital what is it the human resource what is human resource the man who is working his brain his hands and legs which are trained to do certain things for example anybody who puts his leg on the accelerator the car or bus will move forward anybody who turns the steering the car will turn but then you cannot become a good driver you need to be trained so if you are properly trained driver then you become a truck driver if you are still better driver you become a bus driver because human life is more precious than the contents of the truck now if you know how to turn a bus because you know how to do a steering wheel if you know how to make the bus go forward because you can put your legs on the accelerator and press can you make the elephant go forward no for that you need a different training so human capital is a different types of capabilities built into humans by way of education and training and their health so that they can do certain job now there can be a person who is working as a doctor because he is highly trained and highly capable and highly knowledgeable but his health may not be suitable enough to work in the farm in the sun to do the plowing so health is also one of the human capital aspects so alfred marshall talked about capital what is capital capital is all kind of wealth other than the gifts of nature which can yield income all kinds of wealth other than gifts of nature which can yield income what type of wealth physical wealth like machinery tool building land etc or monetary resource like equity debt and cash or human resource like the education that you have had the training specialization that you have done the good health that you have is all is capital now if you are 99 years old for example or 105 years old for example your health may not be best enough to become a jockey your health may not be best enough to operate a crane so at that time what happens you don't have enough human resource capital even if you have money and even if you have a crane you will not be able to use it to make some meaningful value addition to somebody so what are the characteristics of capital it is a passive factor it doesn't do anything on its own the entrepreneur the man makes it do it capital is a passive capital 
it is man made it is a derivative capital it is not indispensable factor it is not indispensable that means what if you don't have one machinery you can bring another machinery if you don't if one tool is not working you can buy another screw driver if this building is not suitable you can hire on rent another building capital has the highest mobility that means what the equity and debt that you put into an enterprise can go out at any point in time if something else is found profitable you will ditch this project and go and take up the other project capital has the highest mobility more than human capital capital is productive it is giving you results though it is passive it is productive it is giving you results it gives you production of goods and services which will find utility and in turn give value for you it lasts over time it remains for long time the machinery will run for one year the training or education that you had will give you an income capability for lifetime capital involves present sacrifice to get future benefits when you put money into equity you don't get anything now but after a few years the 100 you invested will become 1000 so future you will get benefit that's the characteristics of capital now who is a entrepreneur entrepreneur is the one who takes the risk it's a derived capital a person who combines different factors if he just combining is he adding 1 plus 1 equals to 2 is he just bringing the inputs together is he just a broker a person who combines different factors in right proportion he should know how much land how much labor how much derived capital of uh, money or machinery or plant is required and how much entrepreneurship or risk to be taken so it's a right proportion and then he initiates the process of production production is what converting the materials given by nature into something of use to some consumer that is production it should having it should be having some value and should provide some utility only then it is production and so the entrepreneur does what he combines the factors of production in the right proportion initiating the process of production for what to get the output what output output of utility and he does what he bears the risk of loss and does what he earns the right for the profit he earns the right for the profit he bears the risk of loss and he creates an output of some utility now suppose you create conflicts you brought all the factors together you brought a machinery you did marketing everything you did but nobody is buying then what so you should be able to create something of your utility take the loss also for your action but also earn the profit for the value that you add and you are a change agent for the social welfare what is social welfare everything that is of production should be of some utility to a customer everything produced should add some value to the consumer so when your value is added you will be more happy that is what is called the social welfare so when society is better off by this addition of a goods or a service and if that is produced by you you caused this change to be better off then you are an entrepreneur so what is an entrepreneur do entrepreneur identify the investable opportunity he finds out whether it is to better to make cake or a bake or a biscuit or a bread investable opportunity then he selects a profitable venture he decides how to how to make it in what sort of factory what sort of company what sort of uh, organization then he raises capital capital can be in the form of plant or machinery or the people to work or training of the um, skilled hands to do this conversion of the inputs all that is monetary resources human resources all is capital then he procures inputs he brings in for example in case of a bread factory he will have to find out whether to bring flour or whether to bring the wheat and convert into flour he says how to bring all these things then you need salt you need water you need so many things for, for making the bread decide on the location of the production unit whether to make it in india or in africa if it in india whether to make it in delhi or in some other place this location of the production plant how is this is decided sometimes it is decided based on is it closer to the market sometimes it is decided based on whether is it closer to the inputs inputs can be raw material like wheat input can be um, land or labor it can it can be so many things so this is a decision and then determine the target market to whom to sell is it for export market or domestic market if domestic market for cities or for the rural people will it be consumed within the village so determine the target market and make innovations and improvements if you want to just make a bread or if you want to make a milk bread or a multi grain bread or how you want you want to sell it as a sliced bread or a loaf so make innovations and improvements and then decide on the reward payment profit sharing you have to decide 
how much he will pay the labor so that they give you best quality how much money to be spent on the machinery so that you get the best quality how much money you will pay to the farmers so they give you the best wheat so decide on what sort of reward or payment you should give and what you should get at what price you will sell this bread so that people find it affordable their needs are met they find value they find utility and then he take the risk after doing all this it may not sell and then all the money and effort will go away so he will take the risk and then he will manage the uncertainties how by having a better marketing plan by having a better quality by have by transporting it to the right place at the right time so that the form utility the place utility the time utility of the bread is not lost suppose it takes up uh, 30 days for the bread to reach the uh, local shop where you are buying from the bread would have got spoiled so all the uncertainty he has to ensure it is not lost when if the truck is properly having temperature controlled things like that then he has then by doing all this he will ensure utility in the hands of the consumer this is what an entrepreneur does thanks for watching this video we were talking about production as a part of economics for class 7